Okay, we're going to kick off the, uh, the medical and scientific part of the program now. And um, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd just like to say that Nick Dowswell, who is here somewhere, um, is going to be in charge of the roving microphone. So if you've got a question at the end of each section, please just wait for, for Nick to come and see you with the microphone so that everybody can hear your question. Thank you. And so the first speaker for today is Professor Jeremy Tomlinson. He's a professor from Oxford University who has worked on the uh, BBS clinics in Birmingham since they started in 2010. And his main interests have been primarily in insulin resistance, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and, and um, uh, other related uh, issues. Uh, and also in the last eight years through the Bardet Beetle Syndrome Clinics, he's worked very hard to um, get a better understanding of the metabolic and endocrine uh, hormone problems that people with BBS have. So um, over to you. Great, thank you very much. It's, it's, it's a delight to be here. What a, what a fantastic conference, and it's, it's fantastic to see so many people here. So um, as uh, Elizabeth said, what, I, what I'd like to do really over the next sort of 20, 25 minutes is show you a bit of background in terms of where I've come from, talk to you a little bit about what we've learned really over the last eight years or so about some of the hormone issues that affect uh, people with, with, with BBS. And certainly from my perspective, as, you, as you'll see, you know, I've learned a huge amount over the last eight years. And that's really all down to the, the patients, you, that we see in, um, in, in the clinics on a, on, a, on a monthly basis or so. So first thing is, well, you know, what do I do? So my children often wonder what I, what I do. And I think what, if I ask them, and I, I have asked them, what do, what do you think I do? I think they think uh, that I sit at a computer playing computer games most of the, uh, mo most of the day, <laughs> which I can assure you is not, is, is, is not true, honestly. Um, and I, I sort of do have three hats. Um, and I have a, a, a clinical hat, which is seeing patients with hormone conditions, uh, which I, I do probably 40, 50% of the time. I have a research hat, so I'm very interested in, in patients and the conditions they have, understanding why they have these conditions. What treatments can we offer patients? So I have a research hat. And again, we'll, we'll show you today some of the research that we've, we've done um, looking at the endocrine issues that affect patients with BBS. And then there's a, clearly a, a, a teaching hat. Part of a research, part of being a, a, a doctor is making sure that actually that next generation of doctors that come through the system uh, have as much knowledge as possible and can then continue to pass on that knowledge to their next generation. And again, I'll show you potentially how, how that's important really in the context of, of, of BBS. So I have three different hats that I wear on, 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 on different days at different times, which keeps me, keeps me on my toes most of, the, most of the time. So the first thing we really need to, to ask is, and, you know, as an endocrinologist, I'm an endocrinologist, and, and that's a very confusing, confusing name. So what is an endocrinologist? Well, an endocrinologist is really a doctor that studies hormones. And again, people often wonder, well, well what, is a, what is a hormone? And a, a, a hormone is just really a fancy medical term for a substance that gets produced by a, a gland in the body. That's just an organ in the body that produces substances. They then circulate, by and large, in the, in the blood and affect distant organs and distant, distant tissues. And that's what hormones are. They're sort of signals produced by one part of the body that signal and affect another part of the body. And as an endocrinologist, we study those hormones, we're interested in the clinical effects of those hormones, and indeed the organs, the effects that they have on the organs um, that, that are, uh, affect many different parts of the body. So that's what, that's what endocrinologists, endocrinologists do, they're hormone, hormone doctors. So what are the, um, what are the hormone glands, the, 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 what is the endocrine system? What do we, what do we get excited about? What do we, what do we look at? Well, there's lots and lots of different endocrine glands in, 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 in the body. And again, we'll have a bit of a whistle-stop tour through many of the, 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 the endocrine glands as we go through this talk. There's the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland is sort of the master gland in the body. It sits at the base of the brain, sort of just behind the, uh, the, 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 the eyes, and it controls every other gland in the body. So it sends out signals, sends out hormones that control the thyroid gland, which sits in the neck. We'll talk about that a little bit later. In women, it tells the ovaries how to function. In men, it tells the testes how to function. It controls all sorts of different glands. Your stress glands, whether you produce enough stress hormones, that's all controlled by your pituitary gland. So it's a very important, but perhaps one of the smallest glands that we, that, that we focus on. The thyroid gland sits in the, in the neck like a bow, bow tie. And again, we'll talk about the thyroid gland and Bardo beetle syndrome in a minute, but that sort of controls the rate at which we all function. We'll talk a little bit about 
diabetes and the pancreas. The pancreas is, is another, another gland that you may well have heard of. It sits sort of deep within the, the upper part of the, uh, the, the, the tummy, the abdomen, and produces a variety of hormones, but the important one, really, that it produces is insulin. And insulin is very important for controlling blood sugar levels, and when that doesn't work quite as well, that can put you at risk of developing diabetes, and we'll talk a little bit about diabetes in the context of Bardet Beadle as well. And again, as I've already mentioned, we'll talk a little bit about testes and testosterone in men, and we'll talk about ovaries and the condition of polycystic ovary syndrome in, in, in women. So lots of different glands that, again, keep endocrinologists on their toes because they have to look at lots of different hormones in different contexts. Okay, so I said right at the beginning that one of the hats that we wear is about education and teaching. So when, you, when, when as a medical student, what you do is you, is you pick up textbooks. So there are various esteemed textbooks of endocrinology, um, one of which is called the Williams Textbook of Endocrinology. And this is, uh, I say, it's a huge, great three or four volume textbook. And if you, if you look at what the Williams Textbook of Endocrinology has to say about hormones and Bardet Beadle, um, it says this. It says the onset of obesity, usually in infancy, hypogonas, and that just means low levels of, of the sex hormones, either testosterone or estrogen in, in, in women, is characteristic and males are infertile, as are most females. That's what it says. So that if you're a medical student or a doctor and you pick up a textbook of endocrinology, that's what, that's what it says. Okay, other textbooks. There are other textbooks are available. So we have now the Oxford textbook of endocrinology and diabetes, another huge, great, big, multi-volume textbook of endocrinology. Well, what, do, what does that say about Bardet Beadle? Well, it says hypogonism again, so that's the low levels of testosterone, low levels of female hormone, usually present in all men. Period irreg irregularities in periods are present in almost all women. So that's what the textbook's saying. So that's what we're telling the next generation of medical students, doctors coming through. And you think, well, actually, well, perhaps these were just published a very long time ago. Well, it's not true, because actually these were published, the Williams textbook was published in 2015, so only a few years ago. And we're just updating the Oxford textbook of endocrinology and diabetes, but that was published in 2011. So actually, what we're telling our next generation of medical students, doctors about Bardet Beadle, I think is doing Bardet Beadle syndrome, a patient with Bardet Beadle syndrome, a great disservice, as we'll see in a, in a moment as we, as we go through, because this is really all the information that they, they're getting from the biggest textbooks that, that, that are available. Okay. Let's get down to some hormones. So let's talk about diabetes. Diabetes is very, very common. Um, it affects about 3 million people in the United Kingdom, um, and that has increased dramatically since the, over the last sort of 10, 15 years. It's probably almost doubled or tripled in, in, um, in, in its incidence over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. So it, it, the rates now of diabetes, depending on the age of the population, as we get older, the risk of diabetes increases, and certainly once you get into later adult life, maybe 10 to 15% of the population are either at risk or actually have type 2 diabetes, and we'll come on to the differences between type 1 and type 2 diabetes in a, in a, in a moment. Um, but the majority of diabetes that we see, certainly in the context of bardet beadle syndrome, is what we term type 2 diabetes. And diabetes is rapidly becoming one of the biggest health problems that we're, that, that we're facing. So what, what is diabetes? How do we regulate blood sugar? Diabetes is a condition whereby you can't regulate your blood sugar levels properly and your blood sugar levels become elevated. So you've probably all had a very nice, very nice breakfast um, and part of that breakfast will contain, contain sugar. Once you eat that, that breakfast, that, that sugar, what then happens is, is that gets, the sugar gets into the glucose, gets into your blood. That blood then gets delivered to your pancreas and your pancreas then senses that high level of blood sugar, and in response to that high level of blood sugar, produces this hormone, insulin. What does insulin do? Well, it's a hormone, as we said right at the beginning, hormones are signaling their messengers that get out into the blood and affect other organs. Well, that insulin that's being produced by the pancreas then signals to all sorts of other different tissues, in particular the muscle. And what it does then is allow that sugar from the blood to get, and from the blood, into the muscles, and that's one of the things that insulin, insulin does. You then use that sugar, that glucose, a bit like the petrol in, in a car, to fuel all the processes that you need to keep your cells happy. And so without insulin, that sugar stays in the blood and can't get into the muscles. Your muscles can't work very well, your sugar levels get very high in the blood, and that's what is, is, is diabetes. 
And as many of you will be aware, there are two different sorts of diabetes. It comes in two different flavours, type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is a condition whereby there's a problem with the, the pancreas in the sense that the pancreas just doesn't produce enough insulin. That's the type of diabetes that is much more common in childhood. It, it arises really as a process whereby your own body starts to attack the pancreas. And it's pretty uncommon, as you'll see in a moment, in patients with Bardet Beagle. The common sort of diabetes that we see, and again, it's the type of diabetes that we see most commonly in the, in the UK, is type 2 diabetes. It tends to occur more in adults, although we do see young patients with, with type 2 diabetes. That's caused not because the pancreas doesn't produce enough of that signaling molecule, the insulin, but it is caused by the fact that that insulin just doesn't work. So the insulin gets to the muscle, but for whatever reason, when it tries to signal through that muscle to allow the glucose, the sugar, to get into the muscle, it just doesn't work. You might ask, well, why doesn't it work? And the answer is, well, we don't really know why it doesn't work. Lots of different theories, lots of research ongoing as to why it doesn't work, but it's just not effective at allowing that sugar to get out of the blood into the muscle. So that's type, type 2 diabetes. So how do you treat it? Well, there's a whole variety of treatments that we can adopt. And you can imagine how, they, how these might work. So clearly, if you put a lot of sugar into the system, then your body's got to deal with a lot of sugar. So the first treatment that we always have for, for patients with diabetes is to think about lifestyle. Because actually, diet is really important. If you have a diet that's very high in sugars, then your body is going to struggle to deal with those. We also know that as patients gain weight, that can also make it more harder for that insulin molecule to work. We become what we term resistant to the effects of that insulin. So if we can lose weight, if we can have a healthy, balanced diet, that's always the first step in the treatment of any patient with, with, with diabetes. We do use drugs, and the drugs can target various things. We can try and make that insulin work better. We can try and get your body to produce more insulin. And the other thing that we often do is try and get people to exercise as much as possible. Because exercise, in addition to the, the, the drugs that we use, can help that insulin work better. And again, we, what we don't understand is really how exercise specifically makes that insulin work better. But it's very much a combination of a variety of things. It's a combination of lifestyle, exercise, drugs, trying to lose weight, having a healthy, balanced diet. All these things are the way that we approach diabetes. And in patients with, with Bardet Beetle syndrome, then actually there's no necessary difference in how we might approach diabetes. All those things become really, really important. It's very difficult to achieve in some circumstances, but actually they're all really important. <coughs> so what have we learned from some of the research? Going back to those textbooks, you remember we had just a very brief description of that was all that was in the textbooks. What about diabetes and Bardet Beetle syndrome? Well, this is data again. Um, now, really, from all the clinics, both in London and, and in Birmingham, that we've recently, recently published. And again, when you look at the data, what it shows is that maybe about 16% of patients with Bardet Beagle syndrome have, uh, by and large, type 2 diabetes. That's where the insulin doesn't work. That's the common form of diabetes. And you'll remember what I said is that the rates in the UK across the population, as we get older, are around about 10%. So diabetes is more common in patients with Bardet Beagle. But in some textbooks, you will say that uh, you, will, you, will, you will hear that, that, that diabetes is common in almost all patients with Bardet Beagle. And I think we now know from the clinics that we've been doing in Birmingham and London that that really isn't the case. And it's perhaps less common than we previously thought. So about 15, 16% of patients with Bardet Beagle have got diabetes. Very, very few have got type 1 diabetes. That's where you don't produce enough insulin. And when we look at how that diabetes is managed across patients with Bardet Beagle, about a quarter are managed just with diet and lifestyle alone, and that's sufficient to control the diabetes. About a third take a tablet called metformin. Metformin is a very standard treatment, the commonest treatment that we use for diabetes. The way metformin works is it helps your own body's natural insulin work, work better. And about a third of patients with Bardet Beagle take metformin. And about 40% use insulin to treat their diabetes. And again, in some patients, even if that insulin doesn't work, we can control their diabetes by giving, giving them back extra insulin just to really see if we can drive all that sugar, that glucose, that fuel, that energy into the cells to make, it, to make them work better. 
Okay, that was diabetes. What about weight? Weight's a problem across the board in the UK. It's a problem across the, across the world. And if you look in Britain at the moment, about 70% of men and about 58% of women are either overweight or obese. And that's the, the, the way we categorize that is according to your body mass index, which puts your weight and height in proportion. And I say, it's, it's a problem that is increasing across the, across the country. And again, in various parts of the country, the obesity overweight rates do, do differ. It's a, a, a bigger problem, if we're, if we're honest, in the, in the north of England than it is in, in, in the south. Um, in London, about 50 to 60% are overweight or obese, whereas up in the, the north of England, maybe closer to 70%. But again, it's a problem that's a national problem. It's a global problem. It's a worldwide problem. And it's not just confined to the, to the, to the UK. We do know that patients with Bardet-Beedel syndrome struggle with, struggle with weight. And again, when we've looked at weight in patients with Bardet-Beedel, a relatively small number are able to maintain a very healthy body weight. We do see that perhaps actually 50 or maybe 60% are either overweight or actually about or, or, or obese with a body mass index. Again, the figure that we use is, a, is 30, and that characterizes the, the, the distinction between overweight and, and, and obesity. Um, and we see a significant proportion of, of patients with Bardet Beadle syndrome that do struggle with weight. Why is that? Again, that's an area of, of active research. What we do know is the fat cells in patients with Bardet-Beedle syndrome do appear to behave very differently from patients that don't have Bardet-Beedle syndrome in the sense that they may be more well, more programmed to, to, to store fat in comparison with, with patients that don't have Bardet-Beedle. So whilst excess weight may contribute to, for example, some of the risk of, of, of diabetes, there are reasons as to why patients with Bardet Beetle might accumulate more weight than, than, than others. Well, that's one thing. Weight is just one component. And there's a, a concept that actually you can be overweight, but actually be pretty, pretty healthy. What we call metabolically healthy, but overweight or, or, or obese. What do we know about the, the metabolic health of patients with Bardet Beetle syndrome? Well, cholesterol levels overall, when you look at the cohorts of patients with Bardet Beetle syndrome, appear to be pretty, pretty normal. Blood pressure may be slightly higher, but not dramatically so. And there's this thing called the metabolic syndrome, which occasionally you might hear about on the radio or the telly. Um, and metabolic syndrome is just a cluster of things that get grouped together. And that cluster of things that gets grouped together tends to put people in risk categories for the development of things like heart attacks and strokes. What we do see is that patients with bardet beetle syndrome do appear to be at a slight increased risk of metabolic syndrome. So in the cohorts that we've looked at in Birmingham and London, 54% of those patients had evidence of metabolic syndrome whereas 26% in our control matched group, which was a group that was matched for, for age and weight, um, had metabolic syndrome. And what sort of things do we mean by metabolic syndrome? Well, it's things like blood pressure. It's things like cholesterol, the fats in the blood, how well your body handles insulin, people with diabetes. It's that cluster of things that we put, to, put together. So again, some evidence from in patients with Bardet Beadle that metabolically, with this metabolic syndrome, maybe may, may be more, more at risk. What about thyroid? We talked about thyroid right at the beginning. It's this gland like a bow tie that sits in your neck, produces something imaginatively called thyroid hormone. Um, and what does it do? Well, it controls a whole variety of things. It controls the rate at which we function. If your thyroid is overactive, you produce too much thyroid hormone. You tend to run around, um, lose weight, you can't sleep you sweat a lot and your heart rate can compound. Um, if your thyroid is underactive, you can do, you just slow down. It can make it more difficult to lose weight. You can sleep a lot. Um, and what we've looked at in patients with Bardet Beadle is their thyroid function test. And the vast majority of patients with Bardet Beadle syndrome have entirely normal thyroid function. So 77% have normal thyroid function. We divide up underactive thyroids into two categories. You can have a very mild underactive thyroid gland or a properly underactive thyroid gland. And about 7% of patients with bardet beadle syndrome have a properly underactive thyroid gland. And about 20% have 
a borderline, a mildly underactive thyroid gland. And sometimes, not all, but sometimes that can benefit from and can require treatment with replacement of thyroid hormone, but not in all cases. And that's something that is often discussed in the, in the, in the context of the clinic. So if we said that 7% have got a, a properly underactive thyroid gland that does require treatment, 20% have got a, a borderline underactive, if you compare that with what rates would we expect in, a, in, in people without Bardet beetle, around about 5%. So in terms of what we've now learned about thyroid function tests in, in, in Bardet beetle syndrome, then we have to be vigilant really for an underactive thyroid gland because that can cause problems in, 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 in patients. Polycystic ovary syndrome is one of my, my, my interests, both clinically and from a, from a research perspective. And it is almost certainly the commonest endocrine hormone condition that we see. It affects one in 10 women. Um, and what is it? Well, it is a constellation of things. By and large, it's, it's, it's three things that can, 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 can affect women. Um, it affects periods and ability to, con uh, to conceive. There's an imbalance of hormone levels such that all women produce male type hormone levels, but sometimes in polycystic, patients with polycystic ovary syndrome, those levels can be slightly elevated or the effects of those hormones can be at an, an imbalance. And thirdly, you can sometimes see little cysts actually on the ovaries if you do special scans of the ovaries. Other things that it can present with, it can present with a difficulty in losing weight, some hair growth on the face, hair loss on the head, oily skin, problems with weight issues, and all these things, as I'm sure you can imagine, really can have a dramatic effect on mood, depression, um, and all these, sorts of, all, all these sorts of issues. It's very often associated with a characteristic distribution of fat. So you may have heard about apple and pears, <clears throat> such that there are two sort of shapes of, of both men and women. Um, there are people that tend to accumulate fat in, a sort of, in the upper part of their body, that have a slightly more what we call apple shape. And there are people that tend to accumulate fat around about the, sort of the waist and hips and around the, the, the bottom, which have a more pear shape. And it's that apple shape distribution, the more fat in the upper part of the body that seems to be associated with the development of polycystic ovary, ovary syndrome. From our data and the, with, across the Bardet beetle clinics, about 15% of women with Bardet beetle syndrome have polycystic ovary syndrome. So again, this is more frequent than we might expect from the general population where we said maybe one in 10, so 10%, five to 10% is the figure that we, that we carry around. The other thing to say, and again, the reason for, for, for mentioning this, um, so several uh, women with, with Bardet beetle syndrome um, in the cohorts have now conceived and have children, is going back to what we saw in those textbooks which was saying that menstrual irregularities are common in, in virtually every woman with, with Bardet beetle syndrome, as is infertility. And clearly now from the data that we've established from these clinics across the country, that is absolutely not true. <coughs> okay, let's talk testosterone. Um, so testosterone, male hormone testosterone, women and men produce testosterone. Um, and testosterone has lots of important roles. Okay, um, it's not just about bodybuilding. It's not just about sexual function. It's a lot of things. What does testosterone do? Well, it's important for maintaining bone health. It does help reduce fat mass and increase muscle mass. Um, and as many of you will be aware, there are athletes, cyclists, that abuse testosterone. It is a, a, an athletic drug of, of, of abuse. So it has a whole variety of things that, that, that are important um, that affect pretty much most organs in the body, so muscle, fat, bones. Okay, so testosterone is actually a very, very important, important hormone. And it's important when there's too much because that can cause medical problems. And it's also important when, when, there's, when there's not enough. And the majority of men with Bardet beetle syndrome have plenty of testosterone, have a normal level of testosterone. So about 80% of patients with Bardet beetle have normal testosterone levels. But there are about 20% that, that do have low testosterone levels. And again, in the same way that we mentioned with polycystic ovary syndrome, those textbooks, the, the Williams textbook, the Oxford textbook, were saying that low levels of testosterone are pretty much across the board in patients with Bardet beetle. Well, we now know that that, that simply, again, isn't true. So 20%, only 20% have a low testosterone. 
80% have normal testosterone. And again, within all the patients that we see across the country with Bardet Beetle, several have been able to father children. So infertility is not across the board in patients with Bardet Beetle syndrome. <coughs> okay, so just to, just to wrap up, and again, I'm delighted to answer any, any questions. The first thing I think it, it, that's really important is don't believe all that you read in textbooks and don't believe all that you read in the internet. Because actually, what we now know is the best information that we can get is really from looking at the patients that we see in front of us. Because that is, you know, they, those textbooks are probably written on the basis of the clinicians that wrote the textbooks of seeing one, two, maybe three patients with Bardet Beagle. We've now seen several hundred. Again, that, that, that's the, the, the key thing. We learn from our, from our, from our patients. So there are different aspects that, of the endocrine system that can be affected by, by Bardet Beadle syndrome. And no one patient's Bardet Beadle syndrome is the same. The endocrine effects of Bardet Beadle are different in different patients. And that's why it's important that as clinicians, we all make an individual assessment of those patients. What is important, again, one of the, the, the key take home messages is that there are things that we can do. You know, if we do pick up an endocrine problem, there are hormones that we can use. There are treatments that we can use to try and both help with the condition, but also importantly, address the symptoms that patients are, are, are suffering with. And then just finally, there are you know, many, many people, and again, I say to many, to many of the, the patients, many patients with Bardet Beadle syndrome that don't have any hormonal issues at all. And again, certainly when they come to the, the, the clinic in Birmingham, we do a, a battery of hormonal tests, and quite often they will be entirely normal and we can just continue to check those over uh, on, on a yearly basis. One of the things that we do need to begin to understand is what happens with those hormones over time. And I think that's the beauty of the clinics in London and, and, and Birmingham is that actually we can begin now to track what we might term the natural history of these hormones. Because as we all get older, out, even outside the context of Bardet Beadle syndrome, hormone levels change. But is there something about Bardet Beadle that affects how those um, hormone levels change over time? That we just don't, but we don't know. Finally, this has been all the, all the stuff that I've presented is, is really sort of a, a, a team effort. Again, a lot of the work was, was driven by the guys in, guys in London, including Elizabeth, uh, Safra, and Bobby, and Barbara, and Phil, um, as well as the, the, the King's Group and John Hazelhurst worked with me in, um, in, in, in Birmingham to help try and collate the, the Birmingham side of the data. But again, the biggest thanks is to, to, to you guys, really, because as I said right at the beginning, you know, I've, you know, 10 years ago, I confess, you know, what I knew about Bardet Beadle syndrome was what I read in textbooks. And I think as you can probably see now, we've moved a long way, and I certainly personally have moved a long way in, in, in the last eight years in terms of what I understand about Bardet Beadle syndrome. And hopefully we can, using this data, really make a, uh, the, the, the management from an endocrine perspective a little bit more up to date, a bit more of a 21st century approach to managing hormone issues in, in Bardet Beadle. So thank you all very much and delighted to take some questions. Hello, um, my son's eight, uh, he has, he's obese, he has underactive thyroid. Will the uh, problems with the testosterone go hand in hand? So um, in, in terms of looking, we do see patients that have multiple different aspects of, 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 uh, uh, of endocrine issues. So sometimes we do see thyroid and testosterone, sometimes we see them individually. I think we don't have quite enough data and patients to know whether actually that there's always that link between thyroid and testosterone. I think what's Im Im important and certainly going from childhood to, ooh, childhood to, to adulthood is continuing to e evaluate, making sure the replacement is, is, is suitable, continuing need for various hormone replacements. I think it comes down to, you know, what I was saying right at the end there, understanding this natural history of the hormones in, in Bardet Beagle, you know, um, you know, we, we just don't know about that at the moment because these clinics have been running for eight years and it's been terrific, um, um, but it requires many years of data which we'll continue to collect to understand what happens over time. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, if I could just ask you to talk about there being tests um, to um, show whether or not there's hormone, hormonal deficiencies. How do we get these tests? How, where are these carried out? Who do so, we go to? So all, all, all the tests that I've described here, they, these were done as part of the routine Bardet Beadle clinical services done in London and in, and, in, and in Birmingham. So whenever patients come to our, our, our clinic in Birmingham, 
there's a few moments of comment about London, um, but in Birmingham, whenever the, the patients come to see us in, in the adult clinic, they have a set of blood tests which includes all the hormone levels that we've, that we've measured here. So they're done routinely um, on an annual basis when we see our patients in the, in the clinic. Are you aware of higher levels of hormone balances in carriers? I'm thinking particularly about the thyroid, low thyroid and polycystic ovaries. Very good question. I don't know um, is the honest answer to that question. Um, I don't know if there's anyone in the audience that, that might know. Um, but yeah, I, I confess, I don't know. My granddaughter's got uh, BBS. She's on thyroidoxin for a thyroid. Yeah. And also, there's diabetes within the family, which is hereditary. So is she more at risk? So the answer to that is probably. So when we look at diabetes, is there are lots of factors that can increase your risk of developing, developing diabetes. Family history is really, really important, actually. And we know that, you know, when we talk about type 1 and type 2 diabetes, type 2 diabetes is a very genetic inherited condition. It's not, not passed down from generation to generation, but it runs in families, more so than type 1 diabetes, actually. So if you've got a family history of diabetes, that would suggest that you've got part of your gene makeup is increasing your risk. Weight gain, as we all get older, physical activity, all those things, irrespective of, of Bardet-Beadle syndrome, can potentially increase your risk. And I think what the Bardet-Beadle does is just give you a little bit of an extra, extra risk. Um, it's certainly not a done deal, absolutely not. Um, and you can overcome your genetic predisposition by really vigorous attention to lifestyle, keeping weight under control. Um, <clears throat> so it probably adds a little bit of a risk, but in, you know, in terms of quantifying which is more important, her family history of diabetes or the Bardé Beadle, difficult to quantify, but <clears throat> it may well be the family history that's a bigger player, but I can't, I can't say hand on heart that that's absolutely true. <clears throat> um, uh. <laughs> Does um, BPS directly affect the endocrine system, or is it an incidental effect? Do you know? Um, so, I mean, it probably does have. A, I think we don't. The first thing to say is we don't really understand the mechanisms. You know, how does you know why is, for example, the thyroid more you know prone to to this sort of mild low levels of thyroid than um, the, than in patients without body? But I think we don't really understand the mechanisms that that that, that drive that. I think when I, when I was showing you that, that, that day data there about comparing the rates of thyroid or diabetes, then um, that was comparing against uh, patients of the similar age and, and weight. So I suspect there is something about Bardet Beadle that affects the endocrine system. Um, whether it is driven, for example, by a specific problem within the fat cells that then impacts upon the other endocrine organs, we, we, we don't know. But I suspect there's something about Bardet Beadle that we still are yet to, to understand that affects the endocrine system. Weight, weight gain per se can affect the endocrine system, but again, the fact that the patients that we were comparing against were matched for weight would argue that there's something specific about the Bardet Beadle here. Thanks, Jeremy, for a really insightful uh, um, talk. So the study was really interesting, I think, in that, as you say, it revealed what I would consider quite a high level of, uh, a relatively high level of folks who have this sort of subclinical um, hyperthyroidism, if you like. Uh, what, I mean, there's a lot of dispute about when or if you treat people with that. I mean, have you got any views on when you treat subclinical, yeah. this is obviously... So I, I tend to have a relatively low threshold for, for treating. The way, as an endocrine hormone community, the, the, the sort of guidance that we have at the moment, this, and this is not specific to Bardo Beadle, is that if you're in that realm of subclinical hypothyroidism and there are, for example, other risk factors whereby you think you may go on to develop a more underactive thyroid gland if you're having difficulty losing weight. There are other symptoms, for example, low energy levels, which affects many patients with, with Bardet Beadle. Then having a low threshold for treating maybe on a three to six monthly basis and then reviewing it and saying, fine, 
we're going to give you three to six months of thyroid therapy. Look at the blood test, make sure we've got them back to normal. Has there been any symptomatic improvement? If the answer to that is no, then I think there isn't necessarily a good rationale for, for, for treating. If the answer is yes, I feel better on this, then I think it's not unreasonable to, to continue treatment. So I, I tend to have quite a low threshold for the starting treatment, perhaps lower in the context of Bardet beetle than out with Bardet beetle syndrome, just because so many of the patients do, as, is, well, as you know, have problems with weight, energy, fatigue, these sorts of things. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. We'll take the last question now because we've got to move on to the next speaker. Sorry, okay. it's a very, very exciting talk. Yep. Um, was there one last question? Thank you. My son is six years old and he is always hungry. Um, he's just constantly looking for food. He never seems full, which is very, very difficult to deal with as parents. We don't know, is that hormonal? Is there anything we can do about that? Uh, really, really difficult. And I think we don't, I mean, we see a lot of, of, of that in, in, pa in adult patients uh, 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 as well. Um, I think there are, there, there are no drug therapies at the moment that we can use in, 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 in that context. Um, and I suspect that there is, there, there is probably some alteration we may hear a little bit later about how um, some of the, the, the brain circuitry may affect this in terms of why appetite might be dysregulated, but it can be, it can be very difficult to manage. But I think there's, there, there undoubtedly will be hormonal aspects that, that potentially drive this. In terms of practical management of what you can, can, can do from a, an endocrine perspective, Unfortunately, we, we, we have very few things that are, that are available, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you very much. That was a really, really exciting talk. <laughs>